Hey guys, so this is the NCLEX RON Comprehensive Review. This is part 6B from the Med Surge Nursing, in which we're going to talk about respiratory disorders and perioperative nursing. So the respiratory system diagnostics test, the non-invasive like the chest x-ray, pulse socks, pulmonary function test, sputum test, CT, and MRI. Then you have the invasive like the ABGs. In the previous video, we talked about the ABGs. Um, bronchoscopy, so that's to visualize the larynx, trachea, bronchi, take tissue from there. For that, you want to have consent before, you want to be MPO 8 to 12 hours before, you want to give a local anesthetic for the throat and make sure the patient's sitting upright. After you do that, you want to check for gag reflexes, bleeding, respiratory status. Then we go on to the Mantux test. If it's positive, it means that the patient was exposed to TB. To actually confirm that the patient has TB, it has to be done with the sputum test. So for the Mantux test, you're going to give it intradermally and then the patient's going to come back and you're going to assess for a reaction 48 to 72 hours after. Okay, if it's in duration, which means hardened of more than 10 milliliters, it means that it's positive for... And then we have the quantifarm TB gold test, which as the name says, it's for TB also. Then we have a thoracentesis, so that's to remove fluid and ear or to give medication. So for that, you want to have consent, you want the patient to remain still and upright, and you want to label the specimens, document everything, have a chest tube at the bedside, and have a chest x-ray before and after the procedure. Asthma. Asthma is chronic inflammation of the airway, which leads to obstruction, so air can't get in and out. Causes could be extrinsic, intrinsic, or from older patients. Extrinsic is something from the outside, like medication, food, inhaled substance, dust, etc. Intrinsic is something pathophysiology type of thing, like respiratory tract normalities. So some signs and symptoms are going to be a typical person who can't get breaths out. So they're going to have sudden severe dyspnea, they're going to be using their accessory muscles, sitting up, leaning forward, just trying to breathe. Diaphoresis, they're going to be sweating, anxious, wheezing, gasping for breath, coughing with a bowel chest. So what you're going to do is first split, you're going to remain with your patient. You're going to place them in high power so they can breathe easily. You want to assess their lungs and vitals. You want to give them oxygen. You want to give them medication like bronchodilators to open the airway because the airway is constricted anti-inflammatories, take away the inflammation and steroids. A status asthmaticus is life-threatening. It means that they were unresponsive to the treatment. So what you're going to do is place them in high fowlers, prepare for emergency intubation, and you give them O2, epinephrine. COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So what this is, this is a chronic inflammation in the lungs. So if you have something inflamed, it's going to cause an obstruction. So that's exactly what happened. Ear can't get out because there's an obstruction from the inflammation. So this is an umbrella term that includes emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis and emphysema are very much alike. The main differences in them is that with emphysema, there's damage to alveoli, which is why the patient can't breathe and can't get air out. And with chronic bronchitis, chronic inflammation, so with chronic bronchitis, you're going to see mucus and sputum, and with emphysema, you're going to see more of dyspnea and cough. So the causes are basically the same for both. It's smoking, age, ear pollution, dust, chemicals, something irritant in the ear. The main cause is really smoking. Some signs and symptoms that are specific to emphysema are dyspnea with cough, first lip breathing, wheezing, crackles, barrel chest, acidosis, weight loss, club fingers, and fatigue. So the reason why you're going to see acidosis is because the person can't get CO2 out. So CO2 is acid, so when you can't get the acid out, it's going to stay in the lung and it's going to cause a hyperinflation of the lung and you're going to have acid and the patient's not going to eat much, so they're going to have weight loss. And with chronic bronchitis, you're going to see mucus production. You're going to see a productive cough, thick sputum, hypoxemia, acidosis. You're going to diagnose COPD through a chest x-ray, pulmonary function test to see how much air remains trapped in the lungs, pulse ox, it's usually going to be less than 90, ABG, which is going to show chronic respiratory acidosis, and CT scan. What you're going to do is you're going to teach them breathing techniques, incentive spirometer, effective coughing, you're going to give them medication, bronchodilators, critical steroids, anti-inflammatories. You're also going to do nutrition, they need high calorie. You're going to tell them to stop smoking because that's the cause of it. Immunizations, you're going to give them rest periods because they're going to be frequent and tired. You're going to give them O2. One key note is that with someone with COPD, you do not want to give them more than 90% of your You want to keep them having a pulse ox of 83 to 90% not more than 90 because it's going to decrease their drive to breathe. Some complications or the main one is called core pulmonary. Just think right-sided heart failure. So it's going to be those same symptoms as right-sided heart failure. Carbon dioxide toxicity and pneumonia. So carbon dioxide toxicity, I don't really see this test on so I'm just going to go over it really quickly. It's caused by CO2 retention, too much or too much O2. 
signs and symptoms are going to be altered level of consciousness, tachypnea, increased blood pressure, and tachycardia. So now pneumonia. Pneumonia you see on a lot. Pneumonia is an infection in the lung tissue that causes inflammation. Inflammation in the lung is going to bring water inside the lung. So it's going to be harder for you to breathe. Some signs and symptoms are going to be stuff that show that it's harder for you to breathe. Like dyspnea, you're going to hear crackles because there's fluid in the lung. Tachypnea, decreased O2, elevated blood blood cell count, and a productive cough. Some causes, just like most causes of infection, could be immunocompromised patients, sedation, lung disease, immobility, post-op, ventilation, older age, tobacco, etc. I just side note that pneumonia is categorized based on how it's acquired. If it's acquired in the hospital, it's called hospital acquired or nososomal. If it's acquired outside the hospital, it's called community acquired. Hospital acquired can include ventilation associate. The patient can't cough up, so microbes suck in the tube. Um, or it could be aspiration pneumonia, where you swallow something and it goes into the lungs and creates an inflammation. So the treatment for most pneumonia is antibiotics. Tuberculosis, also abbreviated TB. Tuberculosis is an infection by the myobacterium TB. What I would know from this is that it's earborne. They love to test on this. TB is earborne. And when you're born, you're going to have the airborne precautions, but specific to TB, you're going to have an N95 mask. Some causes are older, homeless, lower socioeconomic status, immigrations, overcrowding. The signs and symptoms are going to be cough, hemoptysis, which means you cough enough blood, fever, weight loss, fatigue. It's going to be diagnosed through a few different ways. Mantox, sputum culture, and smear for AFB, which stands for acid fast bacillus, serum pontiform test, and chest x-ray. To actually confirm the diagnosis, you're going to go on the acid fast bacillus AFB sputum culture. And then interventions, you're going to put them on earworm precaution, you give them medication. Um, you can watch my pharmacology review for, for medication to treat TB, like isoniazide, rifampin, etc. This is a disease that has to be reported to the health department. Laryngeal cancer. So your larynx is your voice box. But what you also should know about your larynx is that it protects the trachea against food aspiration. So when you have something wrong going on there, you're going to have difficulty swallowing. Some risk factors are smoking radiation, chronic straining of your vocal cords. Signs and symptoms are all going to be around the throat and breathing and your voice box. So hoarseness for more than two weeks, dysphagia, which means difficulty swallowing, dyspnea, cough, persistent sore throat, hard or immobile lymph nodes in the neck, and weight loss. So it's going to be diagnosed just like all cancers, MRI, biopsy, x-ray, CT, or PET scan. Interventions are going to be that you want to maintain a patent airway. Whenever you're talking about the trachea, the larynx, etc., you want a patent airway. Swallowing precautions, because like we said that it's right next to the trachea. Nutrition, pain management, laryngectomy, where they take it out, radiation, and speech therapy. So now we go to lung cancer. So lung cancer, everyone probably knows because it's a leading cancer for people ages 45 to 70. Some risk factors, like we all know, smoking. But what you should know about smoking, it could also be secondhand smoking. Someone else smoking and you sitting there breathing in. Radiation, chronic irritant exposure. Signs and symptoms, the main one, chronic cough, and also chronic dyspnea, hemopsis, hoarseness, clubbing of the fingers, fatigue, weight loss, and chest pain. The first thing you always want to do is maintain a patent airway. You want to check the vitals, the posas, put them in high fowler so that they can breathe more easily. Nutrition, you're going to give them chemo or radiation, or lobectomy, you're going to take out a lobe of the lungs, or tumor excision, whatever to do to get out the cancer depending on how far it spread. Respiratory emergencies. So these are stuff that you really, really have to know for the NCLEX. They could ask it in any different form, like which patient should you see first? So someone with a life-threatening emergency you should see first. Or they could ask you, what's the signs and symptoms, etc. So you have to know the signs and symptoms because they're going to give you an example of what signs and symptoms. You have to be able to identify that it's that. And also you have to know the causes because in the question, if you know the causes, you're going to be able to connect it with disease because they're going to give you an example. For instance, you have a post-op patient. So right when you have a post-op patient, you think post-op, they could have a DVT and then it could go to a pulmonary embolism so that you're going to see and then you're going to see the signs and symptoms and you're going to see if it matches and if it's a pulmonary embolism. First of all, pulmonary embolism. So it's life-threatening. Causes could be AFib, hypercoagulation, lung bone fracture, long-term mobility, oral contraceptive, estrogen therapy, obesity, post-op, DVT, sickle cell anemia, and central venous catheter. So basically anything that could cause the blood to coagulate, to clot, it comes from a DVT. So you have a clot in your body and it enters the circulatory system 
and it goes to the pulmonary blood flow. So, and it obstructs it. That could be an emergency. So, signs and symptoms you're going to have of like respiratory type, type of signs and symptoms like dyspnea, tachypnea, sharp stabbing pain on inspiration, tachycardia, hypotension, sense of impending doom. They like to ask that for some reason. Diaphoresis, decreased O2 set effusion, crackles, and cough. For respiratory diseases in general, it's kind of easy because they have the same type of respiratory symptoms. You're going to have a hard time breathing. You're going to have tachycardia, tachypnea. You're going to be sweating. You're going to have decreased O2, etc. It could be diagnosed through AVG's D-dimer, so that's specific for pulmonary embolism, you should know, chest x-ray, V slash Q scan, pulmonary angiography. Interventions, what you have to do, the first thing you want to do is get O2 into them. Respiratory support, you want to make them be able to breathe. High fowlers so they can have easier time breathing. Initiate IV access and medications. You can look at my medications, the pharmacology video for more detail, but you're going to be giving them thrombolytics because thrombolytics bust the clot and anticoagulants, which prevent another clot from forming. Pneumothorax is another respiratory emergency. So pneumothorax is, it's a collection of ear or gas in the chest or pleural space that causes the lung to collapse. It could cause one lung or both lungs to collapse. So a subtype of that is tension pneumothorax. It's when the ear enters the pleural space but cannot escape. So this causes a trapped ear to put pressure on the heart and lungs. So you could have increased blood pr pressure, you have limited venous return, you have a decreased cardiac output, and it can even lead to death. Then goes a hemothorax, that's a collection of blood in the pleural space. So pneumothorax is a collection of ear or gas in the pleural space, and a hemothorax is a collection of blood in the pleural space. And a tension pneumothorax is a type of pneumothorax that just the ear can't escape. So some causes of all those could be a blunt trauma, like a stab to the chest, COPD, chest tube, penetrating chest wound, anything that could penetrate the chest. Signs and symptoms are going to be your respiratory ones. Respiratory distress, tracheal deviation is specific to tension pneumothorax, because like we said before, it compresses against the heart and other organs. No or reduced breath sounds on the affected side, asymmetrical chest wall expansion because one lung collapse, hyperresonance when you percuss, subcutaneous emphysema, and chest pain. It's going to be diagnosed through a chest x-ray and specific for hemothorax, a thoracentesis. Interventions are going to be obviously your respiratory status, you want to give them oxygen, put them in a high fat so they could breathe, or a chest tube insertion to drain the ear. Chest tube complications. As you see in the bottom, there's a picture. You can see the drainage chamber that drains the ear or whatever you're draining, the fluids, the suction chamber that's gonna suction it out, and the water seal chamber that has the water. So in the water, you wanna see, see titling, and the suction chamber, you wanna see bubbling. Not continuous, not a lot for any of them, not like tons of bubbling, not continuous. Here are complications. Ear leak. Ear leak is going to be indicated by continuous bubbling in the water sail chamber. What you're going to do is you're going to move down the tubing to locate the leak. You're going to tighten or replace it. If you see no titling in the water chamber, then you're going to check for kinks or breath sounds. If you hear breath sounds, that means that the lungs re-expanded and you don't need a chest tube anymore. If you see no bubbling in the suction chamber, you're going to verify the tubing is attached, you're going to verify the water is filled to the right level, and you're going to check the wall suction regulator. If the chest tube is disconnected from the system, you're going to insert, they love to test on this, you're going to insert the open end of the chest tube into sterile water until the system is replaced. If the chest tube is accidentally pulled from the patient, you're going to cover the insertion site with sterile dressing taped on three sides and help tell your healthcare provider because they might want to reinsert it. I would know all these, this whole page, because they love to test on continuous bubbling, no tiling, and what to do if it's disconnected. Airway management. So oxygen therapy. Oxygen therapy is used for respiratory problems like hypoxia or hypoxemia. You're going to see signs and symptoms of hypoxia and hypoxemia like tachypnea, tachycardia, restlessness, something that the patient's trying to breathe. What you're going to do is you're going to assess for electrical hazard. You're going to post a sign that says oxygen in use. You're going to wear coughing gloves and you're not going to smoke. Then we go on to suction. Suctioning is to remove secretions from the airway. The way you're going to know if someone needs suction you're going to see the signs and symptoms. A little bit like oxygen. Restlessness, tachypnea, tachycardia, decrease O2, adventitious breath sounds. What you're going to do is, first of all, you're going to wear your PPEs. Then you're going to place the patient in high fowlers. You're going to take a baseline vitals, including lung sounds. You're going to hyperoxygenate the patient before suctioning. You're only going to suction for 10 to 15 seconds max, and you're going to allow for recovery time in between each suction, like 20 to 30 seconds. And you're going to document everything, the amount, the color, the consistency of the secretion. Then we go on to mechanical ventilation. Mechanical ventilation is respiratory support through controlled delivery of ventilation and oxygen. It's for patients either during surgery, acute respiratory distress, or respiratory failure. 
First of all, you're going to establish a means of communication because the patient is not going to be able to write the materials, use your dry erase board, picture communication, etc. Then you're going to maintain patent airway. You always want to assess the position and the placement of the tube. You want to document it in centimeters where it is. You want to prevent the patient from pulling it out. You want to suction oral and tracheal secretions when necessary. You want to maintain the cuff pressure less than 20. Okay, then we go on to ventilator alarms and settings. So low pressure alarms mean that there's low pressure in the tube. So either there's a leak or the tube dislodged for some reason, it's not the regular pressure. High pressure alarms is, is that there's something in there causing high pressure. So secretion, there's kinking. And the last point is you want to prevent complications. Some complications could be pneumonia and pneumothorax. Perioperative care. So first we have the pre-op. Pre-op is anything that happens before the patient enters the surgical suit. You want to take history, you want to identify risk factors, allergies, you want to check or witness informed consent. We don't give it to the patient, we don't sign it, we just check and witness it. You want to do baseline assessment, you want to verify NPO status, and patient education. Then interop. Interop is from when the patient enters the surgical suit till the transfer to the PACU. So you can have universal protocol, like the safety stuff, you want to verify it's the right patient, mark that the site is marked and do a timeout before starting. Anytime you're in the operating room, you want to maintain strict asepsis. So that means don't turn your back to the field, all those stuff. You want to be responsible for the instrument count. You want to position the client. You want to make sure there's no complications and communicate well with the surgical team. Then you go post-op. Post-op is from the PACU until the discharge. So right away, immediate recovery period, you're gonna have ongoing assessments. You wanna assess their ABCs, the pulmonary, circulatory, neuro, GI, GU, etc. So you wanna verify an airway, that they have gag reflux, breath sounds, you want them to cough and deep breathe, you wanna compare vials to their baseline, you wanna check the level of consciousness, assess the reflexes, monitor the INOs, etc. Some common post-op complications. So you have anelectricus, hypostatic pneumonia, respiratory depression, hypoxia, nausea, shock, urinary retention, paralytic wound hemorrhage, thrombocytitis, wound infection, urinary tract infection, etc. I'm not going to go through all these signs and symptoms because that's within all the lectures. So really after surgery, a lot of stuff could happen. Someone could have a DVT because they're sitting down and immobilized, delay wound healing, the wound could open up, all these type of complications. So that's the end for part 6B. Stay tuned for part 6C in which we're going to go over the GI, hepatic, and pancreatic disorders. Please like and subscribe.